Welcome to Activation Church Online. Please take a moment to share this gospel message with your friends and family. And if this is your first time watching, please text online to the number on the screen so we can thank you personally with a digital connection card. Now let's continue to worship. like that again. Can't get enough Oh, this is 
Thank you again for joining us for our online worship service. We would love to partner with you to take God's word to our world. And you can help us do that at activationchurch.com by selecting the donate option. This is a safe and secure way to help us reach the lost. But remember, we're also here to equip you to carry the message of the Lord Jesus. So don't hesitate to reach out if we can pray for you in any way. Now let's prepare our hearts for the word. But right now, I'd like to welcome everybody who is joining us online this morning. Thank you so much for joining us today at Activation Church. We pray that this message will be a blessing to you. And if you would like to support our ministry in any way, you can do that by going to activationchurch.com. Well, what I want everyone to do at the very beginning of this message, for those of you who are at home, put it in the comments section. For those of you who are here that are here, I just want you to shout it out. Favorite Christmas movies of all time. Shout it out. Let me know. I got Elf. I got Home Alone. I got The Christmas Story. I got It's a Wonderful Life. Is that it? (laughs) Gremlins. Die Hard. Hard. I, I am so glad that you brought that up because this morning we need to settle the fact of whether or not Die Hard is a Christmas movie, and we're, 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 we're going to settle that in just a moment. And once I speak, it is spoken, and it is in place. But all the movies that you just named, they all have something in, com- in common. Every single one of these movies have some form of conflict or tension. It's, it's really what makes the movie interesting. It's, it's what makes the movie worth watching. It's the conflict or the tension within the movie that makes the happy ending so rewarding. Think about Die Hard, which is a Christmas movie, by the way, because it's set around a Christmas party. But we would not be shouting out Die Hard being one of our favorite Christmas movies this morning if it would have just stayed there at the Christmas party with no terrorists. No one would have watched an hour and a half of people just walking around going, Merry Christmas. Did you try the hors d'oeuvres? It was the tension. It was the conflict that made that story interesting. Someone shouted out home alone. What if Kevin's parents would not have left him home alone? What if they would have been responsible human beings? (laughs) Which, you know, just side note, it's amazing to me that this little boy was left home alone and all the stuff that happened, the parents leave, and yet the parents don't get arrested at any point in this storyline. But the the movie, what makes the movie is the conflict and the tension and the fact that Kevin was left home alone. And what I want you to see this morning is your life is a really long story. Think about a movie. That's your life. But within this long story, there's a series of smaller stories. And each small story will have some kind of tension, some conflict, some pain, some stress, some hurt, some heartache, some some love, some loss, all kinds of things going on. And as much as we may hate it, as much as we may say, I don't want that to be a part of my life, what you need to understand is it's actually what makes your story worth telling. See, Sean, it's the battles that you go through in life and you see a victory on the other end that actually gives you the testimony worth sharing. All of these things that we go through in life, the struggle, the pain, the hurt, what it does is it teaches us how to rely on God. And it is those things that actually build our faith. Because without a trial, there really is no need for faith. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you can work everything out on your own, then you don't need God because you are God. So it's the, it's the times in life where we come up, we have a problem. We have an issue. We don't know how to solve it. We turn to God. We see him move in a mighty and a powerful way that we actually see the nature of God working in our life. And it produces this faith and this confidence and this trust in God. What I want you to see today is these conflicts and these trials and this pressure is necessary. It's actually important for our life. But what's more important than the conflict is how we handle it. Turn to the person next to you and say, how you handle it is important. Because how you handle the conflict will determine how your story is shaped. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience. Think about that. Your life's not really defined by the comfortable, convenient times. 
but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Those moments of conflict and how you handle them define the story of your life. John McClain and Die Hard, if he would have just stayed in the hotel room the whole time, or if Kevin would have decided, you know what, I'm scared, I'm not going to fight these robbers that are coming into my house, the story would have had a completely different ending. How you handle conflict is important. To see, we're all going to have it. There's no way to go through life without conflict. There's no way to go through life without pain. It's impossible. But how we handle it is up to us. Somebody say it's up to me. So today I want to go to 2 Chronicles, and we're going to look at the story that centers around a man named Jehoshaphat, who's the king of Judah. His story, if you read in earlier chapters, starts off with great honor, favor, riches. The Bible says that the Lord was with him because he sought after God and he kept his commandments. So things are going great for Jehoshaphat. But in chapter 20, something shifts. There's a conflict. And I think that if we'll look at how he handled his conflict, how he responded to it, it will help us grasp a better awareness of how we can handle conflict when it comes because it will come. You're hearing what I'm saying. It will come. The mark of being a Christian is not that conflict does not come or storms do not come. It's that we learn how to, through our faith and our trust and our confidence in God, to either go through the storm or tell the storm to stop. So watch this. Let's go to 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. The Bible says, After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, and with them some of the Mennonites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Somebody say conflict. So there it is. There's the problem. Right now, all of these armies are gathering together against Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah. Then some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, and behold, they are in Hazon Tamar, that is the Engedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord. I want to pause there. Just because you have moments of fear does not mean that you do not have faith. Just because you have moments of doubt and fear does not mean your life is absent of faith. I'm going to deal with that a little bit later in this message, but it's important for us to understand because there are going to be moments that you go through that you don't understand. It's going to get uncomfortable. You may have some doubt. You may have some fear, but the choice we have as children of God is to shift from that fear and start looking at faith. And that's what we're going to see Jehoshaphat do. It says he was afraid, but at the same time, he chose to seek the Lord. So watch this. Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord. See the shift? Then he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So he's going to get all the people involved. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So Jehoshaphat, as the leader, as the king, he says, I'm going to seek the Lord, but I'm asking the people with me to begin to seek the Lord. That's great leadership. And whether you know it or not, you are a leader and an influence in someone's life. And how you respond to conflict will train them or show them how they can respond to it. This is very important for parents and grandparents to hear today. Because when you face conflict, if you're always freaking out, you're going to teach the people under you that you're leading to freak out in times of conflict. Jehoshaphat was afraid. But instead of leaning into that fear, he shifts his focus. He says, I'm going to seek after the Lord. What I want everybody to do is I want us to fast. I want us to go after God because although there is a conflict, we know a God who moves and rules and reigns in the affairs of men and women. We serve a God who is well able to help us in our time of need. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So he's showing the people of Israel their need to seek after God. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, you rule over the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, 
so that none is able to withstand you. What he is doing is he is coming to God, recognizing God for who he is, and he's doing a declaration of praise. This is important. Because your praise and worship causes God to step down into your circumstance. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. What that means is, when I am going through a difficult time, if I will lift up a praise and start worshiping and recognizing and honoring God for who he is, it gets God's attention. And he says, there's my child. I'm going to step down in the midst. What I want you to notice is, Jehoshaphat, when he's praying, he does not start his prayer with a complaint. He does not start his prayer with the crisis. He doesn't come to God and say, God, I'm in trouble. Where are you, God? I'm hurting. I'm in pain. And a lot of times that's what we do. But he doesn't start with the problem. He starts with recognition and praise. Jesus taught us to pray that way, by the way. When the people came to Jesus and said, Lord, would you teach us how to pray? He gives us a model. This isn't a verbatim thing that we're supposed to pray. He gives us a model. He says, our father, what's that? I'm going to recognize him. Who is he? He's my father in heaven. Then he says, hallowed or holy is your name. What's that praise? He starts his prayer with recognition and with praise. The reason some of you have a flat prayer life is because you're doing it wrong. You're actually coming about it all wrong. You're coming to God straight with your problem and your issue. Is there a time for that? Yes. But we should come into his, his courts and his gates with thanksgiving, with praise. And we actually come into the presence and there is a way to approach God through honor, through praise, through worship. The Bible talks about Jesus and it talks about his prayers and it says God heard him because of his honor. God heard him because of how passionate he was when he came before him. So that's what Jehoshaphat is doing. He's not going with the problem. He's coming to Jesus with, or he's coming to God with some praise, with some recognition. Let's go on. He says, did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? And give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword judgment or pestilence or famine we will stand before this house and before you for your name is in this house and cry out to you in our affliction and you will hear and save you see what he's saying there he's saying when the problem comes we know where to go someone say i know where to go we're going somewhere with this it's going to be really good and now behold the men of ammon and moab and mount seir whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt and whom they avoided and did not destroy. Behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. Our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless. Watch watch this. We are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do but our eyes are on you would you turn the to the person next to you and announce our title this morning it's the fix is in the focus the fix is in the focus he says i don't know what to do but my eyes are on you i i don't have i don't know how to fix this i don't have the ability to handle this situation I mean, if I could had a penny for every time I've prayed that prayer, I would be a very wealthy man because there are just times that I do not know what to do. There are times as a dad that I don't know what to do. I mean, there was no training manual for raising three little girls. I grew up in a house full of guys. I have no idea what's going on sometimes and God, I need help. I need wisdom. I need guidance. I need strength. I I need you, God. As, as As a husband, you know how many times I've said, God, help me to love my wife the way you love the church. Help me to be a better husband than I was yesterday. Help me in the, you know why? Because I don't know how to do it on my own. 
women really are from a different place than men. Again, I didn't know this. I didn't grow up with women. I grew up with guys. I thought we all thought the same. And I've learned we don't. And I, sometimes I don't have the ability or the capability within myself on my own to communicate with my wife the way I should or to love my wife the way I should. Some things, sometimes as a pastor, I go through something with the church or there's a decision that has to be made and I go to God and I'm like, I don't know what to do. Let me tell you about how many times I've had to stand behind a podium like this, walking out of a room on my way to the stage going, God, I don't know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what, I don't know what, I don't know what to say. See, I know that y'all think that I float out of bed in the mornings <laughs> and that I shower with the glory of God. <laughs> but the truth is there are times in my life that I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going on. I am fully aware that I don't have what it takes to accomplish what I'm dealing with. And I'm willing to bet that if you were honest today, there's been times in your life where you didn't know what to do. Just in 2020 alone, you've probably been <laughs> dealt with so many things just in this year. Forget about every other previous year. Just in 2020 alone, there's probably been multiple times that you, if you're honest, would go, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with my finances. I don't know what's going on with my job. I don't know what's going on with my kids. I don't know what's going on with their education because if their math is left up to me at homeschooling, they're in trouble. I mean, let me tell you about digital learning at my house. I'm learning as my kids are learning. <laughs> and and, and it's, it's frustrating, isn't it? It's frustrating when you want a resolution, but you don't know how to get it. You know what the problem is? We're really good at defining the issue, but we sometimes don't know what to do. And that's what Jehoshaphat is dealing with right now. God, I'm being surrounded by all kinds of armies. I don't have the resources. I don't have what it takes. And he tells God in this very raw, honest prayer, he says, we're not able to do this. God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And that's what jumped out to me this week when I was studying this passage. I had never seen it before. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. What you, what you have to learn today and what you have to hear is when you don't know what to do, you've got to know where to look. When you don't know what to do, you've got to know where to look. The Bible says in Psalm 121, it says, my eyes, I look to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the creator, the maker of heaven and earth. And what I want to tell you this morning is if God can figure out how to put a universe together, he can handle your problem. You may not know what to do. You may not know how to handle it, but God can and God will as long as you shift your focus off of the problem and onto the solution, which is Jesus Christ, the creator and possessor and maker of heaven and earth. Because when you look to him, that's when he steps in. That's what's beautiful about it. I don't have to know what to do. I don't have to know how to do it. All I got to do is know who I can look to. And when I look to him, he is faithful. The Bible says he is an ever-present help in time of need. When I look to him and say, God, I can't do this, and I know I can't do it every time he moves. See, I, I want you to know this as a pastor. When I come in here to preach, I tell God, God, I can't do this on my own. I don't have the ability on my own. I can't transform anyone's life. I can't bring change in anyone's life. And God, if you do not show up, if you do not help me today, then this service is not going to work. I need you. I need the anointing of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's very important for us to understand this because I can't control everything. I can't control what's going on in the world. I can't control what's going on around me. I can't control what's going on in the economy. I can't control how people treat me. I can't control who 
stays in my life or who exits my life. I can't control Scott sitting over there. I can't control. There are things that are just beyond my control. There are things that go beyond my natural ability. There are things that go beyond my education level, but it's okay because I know where to look. I look to you. My eyes are set on you. The author, the finisher of our faith, the one who knows everything and has the power to come and give you the solution you need. But that is only for people who look to him. See, there are verses that we read in scripture that say, like, you're more than a conqueror. That's true. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. That's true. But that is reserved for the people who are looking to him for the help. I can't look at the size of my opposition. I have to look at how big and how great my God is. See, both are going to be present in your life. There's always going to be conflict, but there's always going to be God. And you get to choose as a person what or who you're going to look to. The reason we, we mess up and the reason I've messed up in my life in the past is because when I go through something that, that's, that's difficult, I've looked to the wrong thing or the wrong substance to be my help. And sometimes it gives temporary relief. I mean, let's just be honest with you in here. I know that most of y'all have never tried certain things in your life. I know that y'all are, the, you know, the 930 crowd, y'all are the holy ones. But there's been times in my life where I've tried to fix my problems with a relationship, where I've tried to fix my problems with a substance. I've tried, and, and there, there are times that you get a moment, you, you get a sh- quick fix, and it feels good. But it's never lasting. And it doesn't give you good results, and it doesn't give you l- lasting victory. The only one that can do that is God. The Bible says that Jehoshaphat was afraid. He was afraid of the problem. But at the same time, he set his face to seek the Lord. That's the shift. That's the shift. See, there's a line between faith and fear. And you stand on it. Think about this. There's a line between faith and fear. Think about an imaginary line. Faith's on this side, fear's on this side, and this is where I stand. I get to choose which one I'm going to look at. I can either look at faith, I can either look at the promises of God, I can either meditate on his word and his goodness, or I can lean into fear and I can meditate on the problem. I can meditate on how inadequate I am. I can meditate on my insecurities. I can meditate on my failures. I can meditate on my faults. The choice is mine. But what you have to know is whichever one you look at is the one you're going to give power to. That's really good preaching. Whichever one you look at is the one you're going to give power to. Think about Peter. He's in the boat with the disciples. Jesus comes walking on the water. They get freaked out. They think it's a ghost. There's a storm going on. The wind's blowing. The waves are crashing. Once Peter realizes that it's Jesus, he says, Jesus, if that is you, let me come out on the water and walk with you. Jesus says, come. So what does Peter do? He steps out of the boat, defies all kinds of natural laws, and a human being is now walking on top of water. Think about that. And everything is okay as long as he is focused on Jesus. But what happens? In that moment, he's looking at Jesus. He's standing on water. He notices the problem. He notices the conflict, which is the wind, which is the waves crashing around him. And he shifts his attention from Jesus to the issue, to the problem, to the conflict. And what happens? He begins to sink. See, both were present with him. 
the fear and the faith, the conflict and the pressure, and Jesus. They both were with him, but he had to choose which one he was going to look at. Jehoshaphat had to choose which one he was going to look at. The problem was real. There really was an army coming in. This army really did have more power than Jehoshaphat. But instead of leaning into his fear, instead of leaning into the conflict, he chose to seek the Lord. He didn't know what to do, but he knew where to look. See, the fix is in the focus. It's not in you knowing what to do. It's not in your ability. The Bible says it's not by power. It's not by might, but it is by his spirit. Are you getting that? It's not about you and it's not up to you. And that should give you like really, really, really good feelings on the inside. Because you don't have to figure it all out, Lisa. You don't have to work it all out. When you have these times that you don't know what to do, you need to pause and you need to go to God and you need to say, God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are going to stay on you. I don't know how to handle this situation, but my eyes are going to stay on, stay on you. I don't know what's going on with this pandemic, but my eyes are going to stay on you. I don't know what's going on with my job. I don't know how to fix it, but my eyes are going to stay on you. And as long as your eyes are stayed on the Lord, and as long as you are seeking his face, as long as you are making room for him, then God will step in and do what you cannot do. And that day, he gave Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah a great victory. They didn't even have to fight. All they had to do is stand. See, and I'm going to talk about this probably next week. While they were fixed on Jesus, while they were fixed on God, God speaks. and says, okay, you don't know what to do? I'm going to show you what to do. Stand. Show up to the battle and stand. So that's what they do. They show up at the battle. They stand and they begin to sing. They begin to worship. They begin to praise. And God shows up and fights their battle for them. The enemy turned on itself. And I want to tell you this morning that the enemy will turn on itself. And we're going to see that happen in the world very soon. We're going to see this lying, deceptive spirit turn on itself and devour itself. And the truth that is found within the gospel is going to be presented to the world. We're going to see that happen. All we have to do is stand and keep our eyes fixed on God and he will show up and he will take that place of pain and turmoil and conflict and turn it into a blessing for you. That's what happens for them. They go in, they, they spend four days collecting the spoil from that war that they didn't even have to fight. It was something that they couldn't handle on their own. It was something that was beyond their power. But because they knew where to look. Are you hearing it? Because I know where to look. This, this, this message like really resonates with me because I, I am fully aware of my human nature and how inadequate I am at times. I'm fully aware of my limitations, but I've seen God do so many incredible things just because I trusted him and I looked at him instead of the impossibility. And today there's two categories of people here. First category, there's people in here that, like, you're, everything's good right now. It's hard to believe that there's actually people like that in 2020, but there are people like, maybe you've already been through a storm, but now you're not in the storm, like everything's good. And what I would tell you is learn to seek him early. Don't wait for the bottom to fall out to cry out to God. That's a terrible, terrible time to cry out to God. That's, that, you know, so many times we put ourselves we put ourselves in these problems. We create the conflict for ourselves because we're not seeking after God. And then the bottom falls out and we go, God, where are you? We need to learn to seek him early. Give him praise when everything's going right. Give him thanks when you're healthy. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Give him thanks for your family while they're still here. Be grateful, be thankful, be prayerful, be worshipful early before disaster strikes. The second category, which is probably a lot of people in this room, you're, you're in the middle of something right now. Whether it be with a relationship, whether it be with your family, whether, I mean, you know, the problem, I think sometimes with churches, we, we come and we see people and we just see the outside and we see like they're fixed up and, 
you know, they put a smile on, but we, we don't see the pain inside of them. See, there are things that I see as a pastor that you don't, you don't see. There are things that even the Spirit will allow me to feel and sense within a room that you may never feel or sense. I feel, like even right now, I feel like the weight that is on some people that's in this room. And you're like, you're really connecting with what I'm saying because you're going through something that you don't know what to do. Someone, maybe you're watching right now online and you're going through something that you don't know what to do. Maybe right now you've, you, you accidentally, you think you accidentally came across this broadcast right now, but really God's directed you because you're at the point right now where you feel like I'm going to end it all. That's the solution. The pain and the, and the weight and the hurt that I'm dealing with right now is too much. I can't handle it. And the only solution I can see is to end my life. And maybe someone in this room even feels that kind of pressure. You don't look like it on the outside. You're all fixed up. You look great. But on the inside, you're dying. On the inside, you're broken. On the inside, you're hurting. And what I want to tell you is this. When you don't know what to do, look to him. Because the conflict you are in now will not last forever. That's, you need to hear that. The conflict you are in now will not last forever. It's just a moment. It's just temporary. And if you'll look to God, if you'll trust God, if you'll seek his face, you'll see that he'll come in and he'll move and he'll give you beauty for the ashes you'll see that he actually is working all things together for your good. And if it doesn't look good right now, that means he's not done. You know, we all want like great testimonies and I want to do something great for God. Well, get ready. Because you're going to walk through some stuff. And just because you're walking through stuff, let me say this, does not mean you're disqualified from God. Because some of you, you've backed off. There was a time maybe you were seeking God, but now you're not seeking God. Things are falling apart, and, and, and you know, like you're hearing me say, you need to shift your attention to God, but you're thinking like, well, I, I would, but I've done, like, God doesn't want to hear from me right now. God's mad at me right now. God's angry with me right now. God's upset with me right now. That's nonsense. That's the enemy trying to keep you from the only victory you'll have, which is coming to him. God right now is standing with arms wide open. For those of you who feel like you've run far, you've run hard, God's standing with arms wide open and he's saying, come on. Just like the prodigal son who spoiled his inheritance, who turned his back on the family, when he was ready to come home, the dad was standing there going, come on home. Come on home. And right now that's what God is saying to some in this room and to some watching online. He's saying, come on home. I want to pray with you. And I want to come into agreement with you right now. And I want to ask God to move in a mighty and a powerful way in your life. To take this place of pain and conflict and turn it into a place of blessing. To take the test that you're in right now and give you a testimony so that others can hear of what God has done for you and it gives them the faith to know that if he's done it for them, he can do it for me. Father, we ask right now in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that you would touch every person watching or listening to this message right now. We ask that you would move in a mighty and a powerful way. Lord, we ask that you would give them the strength and the courage and the joy and the peace that they need in this moment. God, it's not going to come from a substance. It's not going to come from a relationship. It's not going to come from a new job. It's not going to come from a new car. It's not going to come from a new uh, piece of clothing. We've tried all that and we still come up empty. Lord, we know that you are the source of life, the source of strength, the source of joy. And so right now in this moment, Lord, we look to you because you are where our help comes from. So Lord, touch them and help them. For those that need to give their life to you, Lord, we ask that they would respond with a prayer of just saying, Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life, forgive me of my sins and be my Lord and Savior forever. Thank you so much for joining us today. And with that I say, amen.